quick note about Q&A. Um, this year, everyone here in Austin can participate by using the JNUC app. So if you haven't already uh, participated in Q&A, all you have to do is open the app, select this session and session Q&A, and then um, you'll be able to start submitting questions that way. So you can upvote questions there. That's gonna help at the end of the session once we do get to Q&A, kind of prioritize the questions as they come in. So, um, but yeah, we'll go from there. And I'm gonna hand it off to Betsy. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and thank you to everyone who may be joining remotely on the live stream. I'm so happy to have all of you here for my session. Uh, it's surreal being back, isn't it? Uh, I feel like just a couple months ago, we were in San Diego. Um, but we are in Austin, it's beautiful. I hope everyone had a great lunch. Um, and we're continuing with sessions. So, speaking of sessions, I actually just wanna point a couple sessions out. Um, James Smith presented this morning uh, about also CI CD workflows, specifically GitHub Actions. Um, so if you missed that session, I highly recommend that you check it out uh, during, when you have the ability to replay those videos. Um, it was super, super useful. Uh, and then also Thursday morning, Jennifer Johnson and Chad Jacobson are going to be briefly touching on their auto package workflow using GitHub Actions um, in the education space uh, and how they use it for distributed IT teams. So if that pertains to your environment, um, I highly recommend you check that out as well. Well, today I'm diving into auto package for Jamf Pro with GitHub Actions. Uh, can I get a brief show of hands of folks who currently use GitHub Actions either for auto package or something else? Awesome, so we got a few of you. That's so, I'm so happy to see that. Uh, so I do just want to briefly say that auto package itself is not my focus today. Um, so I'm hoping that most of you, if not all of you, use auto package uh, currently and are either thinking about moving to GitHub Actions or currently use GitHub Actions to run your auto package workflow and learn a few maybe extra things that you didn't know about. Um, also, at the end of the presentation, I do have a QR code to a GitHub repo where I have uploaded the files that I'm gonna be going over today, um, as well as step-by-step -step instructions um, on how to implement this process, just to make it as easy as possible for all of you. So, my name is Betsy. Uh, I work for Fastly, and I'm a senior client platform engineer. Um, what that means for me is I do a lot of project planning. Uh, I plan out our roadmap for the year. I work on a lot of automation tools, such as GitHub Actions. Uh, I work on documentation, and I do a lot of training. Uh, so this is my second time attending JNUC. First time was last year in San Diego. And this is actually my first time presenting at a conference. So if I seem a little nervous, uh, that might be why. So even if you don't remember anything from this talk or, uh, yeah, if you don't remember anything or don't learn anything, I at least want you to be inspired to explore what GitHub Actions can automate in your Jamf environment. So I'm gonna start with a little story. Um, and I think the story or parts of the story might be familiar to some of you or all of you. Uh, well, I started at Fastly in January of 2022, and one of my first tasks was to fix an auto package recipe that was no longer updating uh, its, its associated policy and smart groups and uh, when a new version was released. So I was like, I can, yeah, I can fix that. It was an issue that I had fixed many times in previous roles. Uh, so I asked my coworker at the time to walk me through the auto package workflow how to get access to everything and whatnot. And this is how it went. So we log into VPN, uh, we remote into the Mac Mini in our headquarters office, we use terminal to navigate to the auto package directory, and, and this is where things get a little hairy, uh, we use nano to edit the recipe directly in the terminal and save it. <laughs> and then we run the recipe in terminal 
which uploads those changes directly to our production environment. Uh, needless to say, um, there we go. I felt a little like this after, <laughs> after that call. Um, and I do want to emphasize that parts of that workflow, you know, or that whole workflow, it does work. Uh, and you do what you got to do, right? Uh, but as Fastly was growing, uh, we did need something that had improved security and accessibility. Uh, so that became my goal, uh, was to fix that workflow. Before I actually started f implementing a fix for it, though, I had to decide and work with my team on what we wanted. Uh, and first and foremost, what we wanted was to feel like this, uh, just a chilling on the beach, just relaxed, uh, and not having to click a lot of buttons. So what we really did want is, uh, first of all, we needed a sandbox environment. And we, I knew that we wanted to ditch our VPN and move to a cloud-hosted solution. And I knew that we wanted to use VS Code and GitHub to edit and store our code. Uh, and we were also using JSS Importer at the time, and I knew that it was we were on the horizon of needing to replace that as well. So how did we get there? Uh, what tools did I use? Well, I came across uh, Gusto's GitHub Actions auto package workflow for Monkey. Uh, they posted a blog post in 2021 about their process. And at the time, I knew a little bit about Monkey. I'd heard of it, but I'd never used it. Um, and then I discovered Graham Pugh's Jamf uploader processors, uh, browsing through the Mac admins Slack channel, uh, which if you're not a part of that, highly recommend you join it. Um, and I just want to give a brief thank you to all of the folks involved in both of those projects, past and present, uh, because without all of their work, I would not be here. We would not have implemented this process at Fastly. So a big thank you to all of those folks. Uh, and so I began by reading the instructions posted by Gusto on their blog post. And my immediate reaction was nine steps. That seems easy enough. I got this. Uh, well, I had a very big learning curve. Uh, and yeah, I ended up it ended up taking me about eight or so months to actually implement this because I was such, I was completely new to GitHub Actions. I was, uh, I knew how auto package worked, but um, I had, a, you know, my experience with scripting was medium. And so, yeah, it took me a long time to kind of figure out all of the working parts. And that's actually why I'm here today, because I wanted to give you a deep dive and go step by step uh, work, going through the GitHub Actions workflow to set up a very basic auto package workflow using GitHub Actions. Uh, so you can hopefully, if you choose to implement it, in a quarter of the time, or maybe even less. So before I dive into that, uh, I actually wanted to briefly cover what we gained and why is this such a vital process to implement? Well, first of all, it gave us set schedule runs uh, that were easily customizable in the workflow. And you know, I, in our environment, we have a separate repository for sandbox and a separate repository for production, uh, our production environment. And this is just one way of setting this up. I know that you can create really complex uh, GitHub Actions workflows, and you can also make them pretty simple. And so, so far, I've opted for the simple route. Uh, but our sandbox environment runs on an automated schedule every weekday morning at 9 a.m and our production environment runs every Thursday morning at 10 a.m. It also gave us simplicity and scalability. So we are, we're able to easily manage access to GitHub in and of itself, as well as the repos. Uh, we use Okta SSO, and so it's just, instead of having to set up VPN through a different provider and, and then teach folks to remote into computers, it just, all of it is in GitHub, and it just makes it super simple. And uh, we were able to start with a few recipes and work our way up. So I was able to disable uh, recipes that were running on our Mac Mini, migrate them over to auto package uh, to the workflow and GitHub Actions, 
and uh, work my way up until I've migrated all of the recipes over, uh, which was really beneficial for troubleshooting and whatnot. It also gave us improved team collaboration. Uh, it made us more efficient because, like I said, we could see all of our code directly in GitHub. We could track issues that were linked to pull requests, to all those code changes that we were going through. Uh, and we could assign those PRs. I'm sure all of you are familiar with how GitHub works. Uh, but it really, really helped our team. It also gave us consistent and reproducible results. Uh, the environment is reliable, right? It spins up a brand new virtual machine every time the workflow runs. And so you are, at least I feel very confident in the fact that when I'm receiving errors, that when I'm going through my debugging steps, that I can effectively rule out the hardware uh, that is being spun up for me. And then it also gave us visibility and monitoring. Uh, the GitHub UI allows for easy viewing of the workflow while it's running live, uh, as well as it ha the log retention. Uh, I, use, I just keep the logs directly in GitHub. Uh, you, they do stay there for a default of 90 days. This is, you can change this, but it is organization-wide. Uh, so, yeah, whoever owns your GitHub organization, that would have to be a conversation with them, but I've never felt the need to have logs beyond three months. And then, most importantly, uh, it gave us an integration uh, with internal private GitHub repositories. So what I mean by that is an example in our environment is we have other internal engineering teams at Fastly that create tools for uh, onboarding other engineers when people are brought on. And they want that tool to be distributed or to be able to be installed through self-service. And historically, how that worked is we had Jamf user accounts that we provided the credentials to these other external teams, external to IT, and they built that into their automation to upload packages and update policies and smart groups and whatnot. And I really wanted to bring that back in to the IT org, so we were managing all of it. And we were able to do this by using the GitHub releases info provider processor uh, in from uh, that comes from auto package because that allows you to reach out, grab releases from other internal repositories uh, and upload them to your JSS. And I'll cover that a little bit more a little bit later. So that's great and all, but what is what even is GitHub Actions? Uh, if you attended uh, James's presentation this morning. Uh, I'm going to kind of go over a little bit of the same thing, but if you didn't, uh, GitHub Actions is a continuous integration and continuous delivery, otherwise known as CI, CD, uh, platform using workflows. A workflow is a configurable and automated process that will run one job or multiple. Workflows are written in YAML and are stored in the hidden .github slash workflows directory at the top of your repository. And they can be triggered by an event, they can be triggered manually, or at a defined schedule. Now I just briefly wanna go over what a, just a, a generic uh, workflow file looks like for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, this screenshot was pulled from GitHub's website, uh, so this, I did not write this. But essentially you have a name Every workflow has to have a name because that is the, the name that you will see in the GitHub UI when you go to the Actions tab to run your workflow because you can have multiple workflows per, uh, per repo. Uh, and then you have the on trigger. Uh, so the on trigger is where you specify when you want your workflow to run. And then you start listing out your jobs. So in this example, they just have the one job uh, and the job has a name. It's just a way to structure your workflow so you know what's going on in it. And then you have the runs on trigger. And the runs on trigger is where you pick your operating system of what you want to spin up. So Linux, Windows, Mac OS. You can choose to just spin up the latest available version of that OS, whatever GitHub is offering. Or you can choose a specific version. So Let's actually start digging in to auto package itself. 
what do you need? What components go into making this a pretty simple workflow to implement? Well, like I mentioned, you need the actual workflow file. So autopackage.yaml is the workflow file. You need an overrides folder. This is where your recipes and templates are stored. You need the auto package tools Python script. You need a recipe list, a repo list, and then there's the requirements.txt file. We're gonna spend most of our time on the auto package YAML workflow file, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, and we're also, I'm gonna briefly go over the auto package tools Python script. These two components are the two that are separate from how a standard auto package workflow <coughs> runs. Uh, like I said, overrides file, overrides folder, uh, where your recipes and templates are stored. The recipe list JSON file is just a dictionary of your recipes. And uh, the repo list text file is just all of your parent repositories that you wanna clone to the virtual machine uh, to allow your override recipes to be processed. So I'm gonna start with the auto package tools Python script. This is just a portion of the script. I'm not gonna go over the whole Python script. We would be here for hours. Uh, but I borrowed this script from Gusto. Uh, this was part of their workflow that they open sourced. And I made very, very few changes to it. Um, I just had to change some terminology and some uh, directory settings to make it work with Jamf Pro instead of Monkey. Um, and so what it primarily does is it processes recipes written in YAML. And this was also a change that I made down the road. Uh, if you do use the Auto Package Tools Python script from the Gusto repository, um, they have built in YAML support now, but it used to support, or it used to just process recipe, plist recipes. It also handles recipe trust changes via pull requests. So it has logic built in that determines if trust is missing or if trust has changed. And it compiles all that information and then part of the one of the workflow steps is to upload that information via a pull request to your GitHub repository, which we'll go over in a little bit. And then there's also extensive error handling built into the script. Uh, and you can send that to your chosen Slack channels. Uh, you set it up with a Slack webhook URL, and I have provided instructions for how to do that uh, in my repo um, if you do choose to implement this process. And then there's the requirements text file. It stores the dependencies for this script, and the workflow file installs those as well. So now we're gonna get into the meat of it. Uh, this is the longest part of the presentation because I, like I said, I wanna go step by step and explain what's happening in the workflows file for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, and this is an actual file uh, that I use in my sandbox environment. So let's get into it. So like I said, you need a name. The name auto package run, I actually kept uh, from the workflow file that I borrowed from the Gusto repository. I didn't feel a need to change it, um, but every recipe does need to start with a name. And then we have our on trigger. Uh, so in this example, uh, we have an automated schedule. It's, it's set using cron time. Uh, so in this specific example, the one through five means Monday through Friday, and the 0014 means 9 a.m., which is, equates to Central Standard Time, 9 a.m., but it's UTC time. Uh, and then we have uh, the manual dispatch. So it's called workflow dispatch. Uh, this is, allows you to run an individual recipe uh, versus running your entire recipe list uh, file, which comes in handy when you're trying to debug issues with a specific recipe. Um, and then you also can uh, run with or without debug mode. And debug mode disables Slack notifications if you have that integration set up and adds a more verbose output to the logs. You can also trigger workflows to run on a pull request, and this is something that I'm exploring now in our own environment. So you can, when a pull request is opened, when a pull request is closed, the pull request can have specific terminology. So like if you want it to run when a pull request is closed, 
uh, that contains a title, that contains like trust info in the title name. You can set it up that way. You can also run a workflow on issue, issue open, issue close, whatnot. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of opportunity when it comes to these GitHub Actions workflows, and there's extensive documentation on GitHub's website uh, if you're interested in playing around with that. So next we have uh, the auto package job. And I'm realizing that that is kind of hard to see, but auto package, we named the job auto package, which is right at the top. Uh, and then we tell it that we want to run on the latest available version of Mac OS, uh, which right now is Mac OS Monterey, uh, I believe. I'd, they are working on cutting over to Ventura, I think, as we speak. And then we have timeout minutes. And timeout minutes allows you to stop your runner from processing if it exceeds this amount of time, which can be helpful if you have any runaway scripts or anything that's going on. For some reason, your recipe isn't processing correctly, and it stops the runner from adding on all of those billable minutes. So the example here is 90 minutes. Uh, I believe our sandbox environment takes about 70 to 75 minutes to run in total. And uh, so I give a little bit of a buffer, but then I know that if it's exceeded 90 minutes that there's probably an issue. And then we have environment variables. The environment variables allow you, I mean, I'm sure all of you are familiar with variables. Um, they're used later on down in the workflow file. But here we have a, we store the auto package download URL in a variable as well as the SHA-256 checksum uh, because we check that later on down in the workflow before we allow the package to be installed. And then we have steps. So after you've named your job, you have a bunch of steps that you're telling the runner what to do. Um, and the first step that we have is to check out your repo. And so you need to check out your repo so the runner can communicate with it, read, write, all of that, all of that depending on what you're telling it to do. Uh, and the, uh, the action, checkout action, is published by GitHub and is available in their actions marketplace. And uh, in this specific example, uh, we've added it to use the commit hash for version 3.5.3 .3 of that action. And in, instead of using the commit, the general commit tag, and that's just a good security practice uh, to make sure that you are getting the exact version of the action that you're wanting to install. And then we also have the setup Python action. So it works in a similar fashion. Uh, we've used, it's available in the actions marketplace and uh, we are using version 4.7.0. Oh, I actually missed a part. Um, on the, on when you check out your repo, there is the fetch depth of one, uh, which just means you're doing a shallow clone of your repository. This is needed um, because it's actually just checking out the last few commits of your entire repo instead of the entire thing with every commit history that you've ever done because the environment is getting deleted at the end of every run. So it's just really not necessary to clone your entire repo to the runner um, every single time. Great, so the next step is to install the Python dependencies. Um, and so to do that, we install an upgrade pip. We then install the contents of the requirements file. And then we're also installing PyAML to assist in processing the recipes written in YAML. And then we actually get to installing auto package. So we're using those environment variables from earlier. Uh, we are using a curl command to process, to download the package from the URL in that variable. And then we use an if statement to check if the package, to check the package against the SHA-256 checksum. Uh, and that's just a good, another good common security practice to get in the habit of, of knowing about and using. So if it matches, if the two values match, the package is installed. If it fails, it will, the run exits and you'll get an error code of one um, and it will stop processing at that moment. 
So the next step is to configure auto package in Git. So this section is equivalent to uh, your preferences file on a Mac mini. So we're setting the path for our override directory. And we're failing recipes that you can choose to fail recipes with or without trust info via a Boolean value, yes or no. And we're setting uh, also our variables for our encrypted GitHub secrets. And I do just briefly want to go over the specific secret GitHub token. This token gave me so much trouble uh, when I was trying to figure out what it was used for, why it was needed. Uh, and the GitHub token is just the auth token. It is created when the uh, runner is spun up and it's deleted when the runner is deleted. So it's super secure, it's encrypted, uh, and it just allows your runner to have the permissions needed to uh, access your repository. And these can be edited in your repository settings. Um, and also the GitHub token, um, you can override the GitHub token. You actually need to override it if you want to utilize that feature that I mentioned earlier that we use where we reach out to other private internal GitHub repositories um, because you need that personal access token to be able to enter that value into both repositories so they can talk to each other. Um, but you cannot have the GitHub token and a personal access token simultaneously. Uh, the GitHub token will always override uh, the personal access token when you're trying to perform that authentication between the repositories, so keep that in mind. Um, and then we set uh, variables for our other passwords. So we have variables uh, stored in GitHub secrets for our API username, our API password, our Jamf sandbox URL, and our Slack webhook URL, so that we can just put those variables directly in our recipes, and when we rotate those credentials, uh, it's as easy as just updating the GitHub secret, and it applies across your whole repo. And then we have our, so a few Git config settings. Um, these are very generic, uh, just our username and email settings uh, to, for in the logs. And then we add our auto package repos. So it's just a simple for loop uh, that iterates over the repo list text file. Um, and so that's what clones all of your parent repositories that are needed for the runner to process all of your override files. And then the, comes the section where we actually run auto package. So all we're doing is we're running the auto package tools Python script and we feed it the recipe list dictionary. So it, the Python script iterates over that for every recipe that's listed. Um, and it will generate the pull request details if a change in trust was detected. Uh, if you don't have a recipe in the recipe list dictionary, then it just won't ever run. And your only option is to run the recipe manually, which can be good. If you're testing a recipe, you don't, especially if you're my, working on migrating it to production and you don't want it to run in your weekly runs, just remove it and then it will just be there for you to keep working on. And then the last step is to create trust, the trust info pull request. And so this section takes uh, the information that the Python script uh, created and added to the GitHub environment variables, um, and it will upload that pull request to GitHub, and it will notify us via in our Slack channels for the different environments um, if trust if trust needs to be evaluated for a specific recipe. So that is the actual that is the workflow file that we use. Like I said, there you can get really complicated with it. Uh, you can keep it pretty simple, like we do in, in this workflow file. But now I just briefly want to go over recipes and how we use Jamf Uploader. Uh, so, like I mentioned, uh, Graham Pugh created Jamf Uploader as a more modern, modular approach uh, than JSS Importer was. And so, really, all you have to do is uh, add Graham's repo uh, to the repo list near the top, uh, and then you just add whatever processors you need to the bottom of your recipe. 
Uh, so in this example, uh, this is just a screenshot of the process section of a recipe. But here we use the processors for chain uploading and changing smart groups, packages, policies, patches, and Slack notifications. Um, and you, so you just add the processors, the whatever ones you want to update for that specific recipe, and you add in the correct auth keys and values and whatever other keys uh, you need to, for that specific processor. And it, at the end of each recipe, it just processes those and uploads them. It really could not have been any easier. Um, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, if you have more questions about uh, Jamf Uploader, uh, there, Graham Pugh and Anthony Raymer, I hope I'm saying his name right, uh, discuss Jamf Uploader in their JNUC presentation from 2021. Um, and Graham also has extensive documentation on how to implement uh, these processors. If, so refer to that if you need to. So I actually have a demo, a pre-recorded demo, that I would love to show for those of you who have not seen a uh, workflow file run. So, and I'm just gonna walk you through what's happening. Uh, so, wow, that is kind of hard to see. Um, so we're just running an individual recipe, which is a Google Chrome recipe that is in the uh, repository that you can grab from the QR code at the end. And so we have GitHub on the right and uh, an example Slack channel on the left. So we just run the recipe. Like I said, you can just see directly in there all of the different steps that will be processed. So we're cloning our repo, adding our Python dependencies, installing auto package, performing that checksum check. It passed, so it installed, awesome. And now we are cloning our parent repositories. And it automatically detected that trust verification was missing. And you can see in the Slack channel it posted that. So we go into GitHub, we view the pull request and what changed in our own recipe for for sake of brevity in this recording, uh, I didn't go check the original recipe where I got that parent recipe from, but you would probably want to do that before just blindly implementing these changes. But I commit the changes and delete the branch. And then you have to go and run the recipe again. So again, you can type in the path to your recipe. And again, if you don't enter a recipe here and you just click run workflow, it's going to process your entire recipe list. Uh, so you can have it run on that automated schedule, but if you do want to manually run your entire list of recipes, you can just go in and click run workflow. So as you can see, it's the exact same thing all over again. Uh, so it's setting up our environment, clones the repo, installing dependencies, cloning your parent repositories. And I do wanna mention that this screen recording is sped up uh, because of time. Uh, so uh, it does take, if you run an individual recipe, it can be as quick as a couple minutes and sometimes it can take up to five minutes. Uh, it just depends on the resources being provided by GitHub is what I've noticed. So we're just running auto package again for this specific recipe and it's gonna finish shortly. And it will, once it's done processing, it will import that successful notification directly into Slack, like you just saw, and it's done. So recommendations and lessons learned. Uh, you know, I really recommend to use GitHub Secrets. I will admit, I did not use GitHub Secrets when I first started implementing this. I was hard coding values directly into my recipes, which you should never do. Um, 
but they are encrypted and they can only be read by the workflow in your uh, repo. So a fun tip though for GitHub secrets is that you can only use underscores. It took me a while to realize this in your variable names. You cannot use dashes or spaces. Uh, the variable value will not be able to be read. Uh, also, set up the Slack integration. Uh, you, like I said, you don't have to, um, but if you are a Slack admin in your organization, uh, you just have to create a Slack app and then grab the webhook URL and plop that into the, the workflow file and it will pipe all of that error handling and successful build notifications directly into your uh, Slack channel of your choosing. And I did, like I, I already mentioned this, but I have instructions on how to do that if you are a Slack admin. If you're not, ask your friendly Slack admin to create one for you. Um, oh, also briefly before I move on, for the Slack integration, um, the Python script posts build results for trust info and errors only. If you do want to see successful build notifications and you use Graham Pugh's Jamf uploader processors, he has a Jamf uploader processor um, called Jamf Uploader Slacker, and that is what pipes into Slack if a recipe was processed successfully. Right, and so use your resources if you get stuck. Um, I spent so much time on Google trying to figure out all of these different things. Hopefully I've answered some of the questions for you if you delve into implementing this process. Um, but also the Mac Admin Slack channel. If, like I said, if you aren't part of that, I highly, highly recommend doing it. Um, there are a handful of people who I reached out to when I was trying to work on this and they graciously helped me figure out uh, and understand different things about authentication that I would not have probably been able to figure out um, in the amount of time that I did if they weren't willing to help me. And also have fun with it. Uh, you know, implementing autom automation uh, when needed is extremely rewarding. And even though you may go through a lot of debugging, um, it's, it's really fun. So that is the end. Um, I believe now we could do the Q&A session if we have questions. Yep, and we do have a couple questions, so thank you so, for submitting those so far. Um, first question, would it be possible to use the Python that's bundled with auto package rather than to have to install a separate distribution? Yes, yeah, you can. Um, I, I just like to verify what version um, I'm installing, um, but yes, you can, it should work uh, if you just use what's bundled with auto package. Okay, are you caching packages between runs or are they downloaded every time? Also, thanks so much for the shout outs, much appreciated. <laughs> uh, I am not caching the packages every time. Um, if you watch uh, James's presentation, he is doing a workflow like that. Um, which I'm actually going to investigate now uh, that I saw him present on that. Um, but yes, uh, in this specific workflow, it is just downloading them every time. Okay. Do we have to use Mac OS runners or could we use Linux? You can definitely use Linux. Uh, I think, um, I believe, I actually never have. Uh, so actually probably a better answer would be, I don't know, uh, <laughs> um, but I do believe that you can use, make it work with Linux runners. Okay. What kind of costs do you incur using GitHub Actions? So yes, there are billable minutes. Um, I actually don't have the ability to see that, but it all depends on uh, what tier uh, of GitHub your organization subscribes to. So if you just have, if you have a public repo, and run auto package on it, it incurs no charge. Um, I do know that. And then there are certain tiers of billable minutes uh, depending on your subscription price. So that information is all on GitHub's website. Um, but, and I, I actually don't know the exact charge of what ours incurs because we are use GitHub Enterprise. So it has a lot of billable minutes. And I haven't heard yet Security has not come to me saying that I'm overcharging their department, so I think I'm okay for right now. 
Have you done anything for Microsoft Teams integration? I have not, but that is extremely an interesting thing that I would love to explore. Um, yeah, just because I know that there is auto package for Windows, um, and so I'm definitely going to look into that. Let's see. Why would a big company not want to run their own Git server? Does it take a lot of resources? Uh, yeah, it can. Uh, just the general upkeep of running your own infrastructure um, is not something that I'm personally interested in doing, and so that's why we opted for the cloud-hosted solution. Um, but I know that many teams do run their own infrastructure, and I commend them for it. Do you have an estimate of how much time these workflows have saved your team versus manually doing these things? Yeah, um, hmm. an actual estimate on time. I mean, I think it's, when you look at the whole workflow, um, I think that I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to come up with the exact word that I'm trying to think of right now, but um, it's, it's uh, how do I explain it? You know, over being able to improve our team collaboration and all of the other benefits that I listed at the beginning of the presentation has definitely saved us time overall. Um, as far as specific minutes, I mean, we're not having to maintain the Mac Mini and headquarters anymore. Um, we're not having to maintain our VPN connection to our office. And so I can say it's definitely saved us time, but I do not have a specific number. Okay, and we've got about three minutes left. That's all the questions that we've had submitted through the app. Is there any other questions that anyone would like to raise their hand and ask today? Looks like enough. Okay. Well, I'm gonna be here all week, so please come say hi, ask me questions if you think of something later. Um, or have any feedback, um, I would love to chat with you. I'm on Mac Admin Slack at Betsy, and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, if you didn't get a question entered and answered, or if you want me to answer better, um, I can put more thought into it. Um, but yeah, there's the QR code if you want to check out the files on my GitHub repo. Uh, yeah, oh, also, I am hosting a brain date. Uh, James is actually gonna be there also, um, and that's at 4 p.m. today down in the Expo uh, Center. So if you want to come chat about GitHub Actions, whether Auto Package or what James presented on, please come say hi. Thank you. You best. It's not something.